interlocutor. You're going. Oh, thank you very much. You're going to interlocutor me. I'm kind of scared about that, but go ahead. Good morning, Let's Mr. Go. Greenwich. Um, yeah, so my name is Nadine Bokter, and I'm a writer for The New Yorker magazine. And we're just writing uh, profiles on notable figures in our time. And uh, we were just uh, wanting to gain some insight into your life, your career, and your research into clocks and time. Um, so, and I've prepared a few questions um, to ask you. Um, and yes, I just want to thank you for joining us today and um, for giving us the opportunity to speak with you. Um, and whenever you're ready, uh, we can get into the questions. Uh, absolutely, we're 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 you. Uh, time is time. Time is money, as we know. Uh, that is eventually something that society figured out. So let's uh, let's uh, move forward uh, in in time. All right, Long great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to start off, um, can you tell us about your upbringing, please? Uh, when and where did you grow up? Uh, I actually uh, grew up uh, here in uh, Colorado, uh, which is where I'm uh, calling you from, and uh, have been amazed uh, since I was a child uh, with the uh, cesium atomic clock that uh, maintains the time for the entire world uh, that's located in Boulder. Um, and uh, I also uh, do spend time uh, in Greenwich, England, I figured close to my name, and also zero on the uh, globe clock. Um, and uh, so I've been amazed with uh, uh, clocks and time ever since I was a child. Um, uh, I've tried to figure out why this has uh, been of interest to me for the last 57 years. I'm 57 years old. Uh, I think it may have to do with the fact that an ice cream shop in the neighborhood that I grew up in uh, was filled with clocks. And as a young child, I began to associate happiness with timekeeping, and it kind of went on from there. Oh, wow. Yeah, that uh, as a psychology major, I appreciate that because it's it's kind of like uh, classical conditioning where you associate to stimuli with each other. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I was wondering, as your interest in neurology developed when you saw the clocks in the ice cream shop, um, after you your interest developed, did you start doing research? Were there any scientists that you were inspired by that you read um, literature for? Uh, no question about that. I've actually uh, developed my uh, interest over the years uh, into a, a, a PhD program that's uh, held uh, now at, at the John Hopkins uh, School, Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. I've become the chair of that program. And uh, uh, it's actually uh, provides a degree in the history of science and technology although of course mine is horologically focused. Uh, one of the first things that interested me and most interesting stories, I think in the, the, uh, the, the march of horology uh, was the invention of the marine chronometer. And the marine chronometer is a clock that was able to consistently tell time at sea. And this revolutionized uh, the ability for uh, any naval uh, navigation to occur because it was very easy previously to find your latitude, but as a result of not having a regular uh, timekeeping piece on the ocean, uh, you could not find your longitude. And as a relatively young pup, I read a book about uh, uh, Harrison, who is the inventor of this uh, uh, longitudinal naval clock. And uh, that kind of sparked my interest uh, in the entire uh, history uh, of the field. Mm. So I began to, uh, do uh, research on astrological-based uh, clocks, I'm on really the true the history of clocks. I so my my field is more is is, is horology, but it's it's truly the the history of horology. As an example, starting out with uh, you know the uh, the sundials, which really really were uh, the first general way that that people kept time. Definitely. So you would say that your interest in in time is more um, the aspect of timekeeping and timepieces, um, or does it also include a metaphysical interest? It includes very much the um, anthropological perspective on what is called time discipline, 
time discipline. If you think about the uh, 100,000 years that Homo sapiens has been on the planet, uh, we really haven't had too much time discipline because it's only the last uh, really 200 years where there was any sort of uh, uh, imposed perspective on time. Of course, churches and, and uh, did provide people with some perspective through the church bell, but it wasn't quite the same thing when industrialization occurred and people started having to be on the job at a specific time um, that time discipline as such, at least in uh, Western culture, uh, became a part of society. So uh, it does not necessarily extend into the metaphysical. It certainly extends into the high end physics of time. Uh, but I'm very interested most definitely in this, uh, this concept of, you know, where does our concept of time come from? I've also done some research um, in the area of uh, how, why is it that it seems like, we all say it laughingly, I will say that Chip and I will say it, the rest of you haven't quite result, haven't quite experienced this yet, but you, you're aware, I think, of this consistent fact that time seems to pass quicker as one ages. And I'm interested in both the physics and the psychology and the neurology uh, of that effect, since it seems to be so universal. Absolutely. Um, have you done research in that aspect yet, or is that something that you're looking forward to? Uh, I'm actually uh, beginning to do research on this time perception, first of all, to uh, measure uh, the difference in it and how, how do uh, people perceive of time differently. Um, I'm also looking at some um, uh, sociological and anthropological differences in pe how people uh, perceive of time uh, differently. Um, and uh, I haven't, what I haven't been able to do is truly uh, do anything other than come up with theories for the neurological reasons. The, the current set of theories that I'm developing have to do with the fact that um, your, your brain forms images uh, and references, and that's how one constantly uh, evaluates the world from when you're a child until you're an old person. And as you age, unless you're an incredible explorer, uh, my theory is that, and the truth is, you see less unique new images. Uh, when you're young, those constant new images are coming at you and coming at you and coming at you, and uh, your brain has to process those, and so that causes time to move slower. Well, as you age, you're seeing less of those new images coming at you and coming at you and coming at you, and as a result, uh, uh, your brain uh, uh, doesn't have as much to process, and that's why time seems like it goes by uh, quicker. At least that's one of my theories. Wow, that's fascinating. It it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I was wondering, would you say that is similar to the theory of time dilation, or does that go in a completely different direction? Now you're into a terminology that I haven't heard. Tell me about time dilation. Um, well, it's a theory that I looked up, and it was by Einstein, and it says that Time seems to move slower when an object is in motion. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not familiar. I wasn't familiar with that. I'm familiar with the concept, just not that particular terminology. Uh, and um, not only is that, well, that's not really a theory. That's actually been proven. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just curious about that, and I hadn't really gotten into it too much? Uh, it's a relatively easy thing to, uh, or it has most definitely been proven. If you look into it, uh, it's been proven through just going to space, uh, as mm -hmm. an example. That's enough of a separation. Uh, and that actual theory was proven uh, prior to us going to space. Um, uh, it, 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 it doesn't just seem to, time is definitely something that is about perception and time is something uh, that is uh, flexible. Uh, whether or not we could go back in time, that would be interesting, but uh, that's not uh, a, a place I, I, I spend uh, much time. A, thing, a, a lot of things I've uh, thought about in my research have been uh, how long we had basically non-synchronous time as a society, and then we had to move to sort of synchronous or standard time, because all that mattered for a long time was what time kind of people around you physically thought it was. And um, that's all that mattered because there wasn't a way to really talk to anybody else or make an appointment as such. Um, and if you were, you know, kind of at that point, uh, maybe in the 19th century, within sort of 15 minutes 
of uh, when you said you'd be somewhere, that was considered to be very much on time. Whereas now, uh, and, and since really the railroads were the, the big initiator of creating synchronous time schedules and time zones and being able to keep an entire eventually society, now an eventual, our entire globe uh, operates on, on a single uh, time standard. It would have been very difficult to do that um, had uh, the mathematician Ptolemy, Ptolemy in um, around 150 uh, AD uh, divided uh, the globe into uh, 360 segments of uh, longitude, 60 segments called minutes, and 60 more segments of each of those segments called seconds. Um, how we define the second, though, has also changed over time. Uh, so that's something that, again, plays into this concept of time being something that is really, uh, I believe, the, the kids today would say time is a construct. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you a question about that. What do you think about um, the people who do say that? Although, I mean, it is it is constructed based on the physics of the world, I guess. Um, but well, it's also based. Mm -hmm. That's exactly correct. There's always, but but think about the perception of the physics of the world by humans, where there was for a long time the day was literally, the day was divided into 12 hours. Well, we're, depending upon where you were on earth and what season it was, was how long each of those hours lasted. In other words, we're now moving into, uh, you know, the fall and the darkness where it starts to get, uh, you know, uh, dark at whatever, four or five, five, six o'clock. Uh, and so we have much, many less hours in the day now than we do at the height of the, the equinox. So uh, those 12 hours were, the day was divided into 12 hours, regardless of how long the actual day was. So that, even though that is the physics of the world in action, it still doesn't have to do with humans uh, deciding at some point to standardize that concept rather than rely upon simply the hours of sunlight. But if you think about it, you certainly weren't able to do much other than, uh, I mean, for a long time uh, after, it, after the sunset. Most people were not able to do much until after the sunset. So dividing that uh, day into 12 segments uh, kind of made sense. Yeah, definitely. So we've come a long time since we started standardizing time. Uh, do you think there is much like there is any more progress that we need to do in our perception and structure of it? Well, uh, from the physics perspective, which is, again, this, this definition of a, a, a second, um, that first began to change when we got into um, just uh, clocks that had pendulums. But in the late 20s, uh, we started to measure time using oscillation of the quartz crystal. Um, but that wasn't enough because eventually a, a quartz crystal will lose time over the course of millions of years. And if you're trying to be exactly accurate, you use the uh, uh, rotation of a cesium atom. And today's uh, cesium clocks, so like the one I mentioned uh, in uh, my, my now uh, living town of Boulder, uh, loses a second every 300 million years. For some uh, physicists uh, doing certain experience though, that particular ability to lose one second every 300 million years isn't enough. So for the last 20 years or so, there has been a investigation of uh, what's called uh, optical time definition, which is done based upon the uh, uh, waves in visible light. And uh, that um, will be, uh, again, more precise than cesium and possibly will cause us to have to redefine uh, how much is a second again. So. No matter how you look at it, in some perspective, time is a construct, whether most people recognize it, certainly if you're doing an experiment in the uh, 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 you know, key areas of physics, uh, you're going to want to know it in a much finer level than most people do. Definitely. Um, so I was actually curious about um, you know, being able to live so close to the cesium clock and if it has inspired you in any way or, you know, if it's been enabled you to do further research uh, or study the mechanics of it. 
Well, I'm more of a specialist in, in the history and, and, and science of the, uh, of the concept of time and time and, and sort of the social impact of time. So I do, um, I do have uh, colleagues, however, who, who maintain a cesium clock and uh, it is nothing, I've seen it. You can actually go to uh, and see NIST one, uh, <clears throat> but it just looks kind of like a box. Um, it's not a particularly uh, exciting thing to look at, uh, although I certainly know uh, uh, what it does. And uh, I've actually been able to uh, observe some of the experiments, uh, invited again by my colleagues, uh, in the measurement of time uh, using the optic uh, theory. However, again, that's kind of, I don't know, a lot of physics experiments seem like a box, basically, to those of us on the outside. And then you look at a lot of control panels, but it's basically a box. So, uh, no, I have not uh, particularly, I mean, the fact that we can measure time at that level certainly has inspired me. It's inspired me to, uh, you know, continue to understand the 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 march of time um, from you know its beginnings in in sundials to uh, later years um, uh, uh, water clocks. They're called water clocks, pouring water from one a mechanism into another, um, and then to the first mechanical clocks, which were actually uh, made in in China. Um, in, in uh, around the seventh century. Uh, then it took until about the 13th century actually for um, any kind of uh, a mechanical clock to occur. And one of the reasons why uh, they'd been measuring time with these, these sort of bad clocks and the equinox was out of sync with the, the Julian calendar by like 11 days. So things were not happening when they were supposed to. And um, that subdivision of the globe caused us to really basically define the second as 186,400th of a solar day, uh, which again lasted for a long time. Um, and then it wasn't until really the 15th century until people were able to, and these were by people I meant very rich people, kings and aristocrats, were able to have actually wound uh, clocks, which which kept them relatively on time, but almost no one else had that. And then, and as I said before, it was sort of midway through the 18th century that uh, Harrison developed that uh, that chronometer, uh, which really put us into a, a, a great position in terms of, of uh, navigation. Now, all spring clocks, though, eventually uh, kind of wind down and and can can uh, change and don't aren't quite as precise as the pendulum clocks that started to become common. Uh, in the 19th century, and that's when clocks became affordable for the average person. Not that a cesium clock could be, but um, for a long time, uh, and still many people do uh, on their wrists, uh, use time pieces that are controlled by uh, the vibrations of quartz. So uh, the march of time and time measurement continues to be of interest to me. Um, I, my newest area of research, as I told you, is in, in this area of, of, of time and discipline. And, and how did this uh, uh, occur over, over time uh, from uh, probably the initial influence of uh, religious organizations to, again, uh, industrialization. Did you know, in fact, that the, uh, the English word clock comes from, and this uh, leads to the uh, connection about industrial religious impact, uh, clock comes from the old French word for bell given that uh, most clocks, uh, uh, really the bell was the only thing most people knew about them. Um, Shakespeare loved clocks. Shakespeare uh, in Sonnet uh, 12, when do I count the clock that tells me the time? Not quite sure what that means. That seems very meta to me. Um, and most clocks for a long time, if you, if you think about it, they really, people, hours were kind of all you needed to be aware of. The idea of being aware of what minute it was, was not something the average person uh, did. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned earlier the social impact of clocks. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand on that. Well, the, uh, the discipline, uh, the concept of that everyone would be on the same page <laughs> as such, uh, to use a, a vernacular term, uh, about time, because there was a long, long time, epochs, in fact, of, of humanity, where there was no time discipline. Um, you, you, time to most humans, again, meant really when's the sun up and when's the sun down, and that's all the time that you have to be able to accomplish things, because 
um, artificial light is is also a re, you know rel available artificial light for the common person is a relatively late uh, in invention in terms of uh, humanity. And so the the theory is, and the question about this time discipline is how much of it was religious influence, how much of it was dealt with by sort of human internal clocks as such. Is there some aspect of our internal clocks that that makes you know a day, the twenty four hours, and, and you know, and obviously though, think about time, think about how crazy our months are, and uh, how wrong they were for such a long period of time. Um, why is it that October? Uh, is the 10th month. What? Wait, huh? Mm -hmm. Something obviously went wrong there with time. Um, and um, then, there's, then there's the other theory, which is that this strict uh, view of time discipline has really truly been an, an industrialization uh, side effect as such to allow uh, capitalism to function as it does. Although that theory seems kind of questionable to me because I'm sure they needed to you know, keep time in the Soviet Union or I'm sure they probably keep exact time. I, I haven't done research into it because you can't in uh, North Korea, but I'm sure that uh, uh, that is, is something too. As I said, time is certainly universal enough to have had uh, the Chinese actually invent the first uh, 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 relatively accurate uh, clocks uh, in the eighth century. So um, that's, that's the, that's the, the question, um, canonical hours uh, in the Catholic Church um, uh, introduced by St. Benedict um, certainly were a, a part of developing this, this time discipline and time philosophy. Um, I do know that certain cultures definitely uh, experience time very differently. Uh, earlier in my uh, career, uh, as I was uh, exploring uh, different ways that people kept time, I spent time on the Navajo Indian Reservation in the United States. And uh, the perception of time is, is very different there. Not only do the Navajos keep their own time relative to um, daylight savings time, they don't do it, they have half time hours, and you'll find your, your clocks on your uh, phone will be uh, constantly changing the time if you drive through Arizona. Uh, secondly, the people there do not perceive of time, much of many of the people there do not perceive of the time in, in Western perspective uh, meaning if you say you're going to be somewhere, at most you you kind of give it like a three-hour general estimate. And if you're close to that three-hour general estimate, then you're considered to be on time. So, and that is maintained uh, uh, as it was then and, and continues to be maintained today. So uh, time and uh, this this time discipline certainly is is definitely a, uh, a construct that is different to pay, depending upon uh, the society and the culture and their need for time. Now the uh, proliferation of the internet uh, throughout the globe, um, including access to peoples and cultures that have not had uh, any, uh, what we would think of in the West as time discipline, uh, uh, is gradually changing that. So, um, you know, and, and many of the countries that are implementing the internet are skipping the wired phase, because why do wired today when you can do wireless? Uh, Mr. Musk is sending those satellites up to provide the entire globe with um, internet access. And <clears throat> there is certainly something I think you may know called internet time, which is synchronizes all of the devices that are on the internet, uh, really with more precision than uh, had, had been capable. So gradually we are all shifting to a globe where we do have this universal time, not only being a construct of scientists, but uh, affecting the entire planet. Got it. Um, yeah, thank you for that answer. That's definitely a lot of food for thought. And um, you said that different um, countries perceive time differently and... Um, More so cultures than countries. Cultures, excuse me. Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't say that, you know, the culture in America and Britain would be very different, but have you noticed a difference in time perception uh, between, you know, where you live in London and Colorado? And uh, an interesting question, um, you know, where I live in the UK is actually Greenwich, which is, is, is zero Greenwich mean time, uh, which for the entire certainly 20th, 19th and 20th centuries uh, has been uh, the place from which sort of all time zones start. So there's a bit of a uh, tourism uh, kind of, uh, believe it or not, with other horologically interested people that, that, that come to Greenwich. And so I get to enjoy that. But 
Uh, no, generally uh, in uh, uh, most Western societies uh, and cultures, uh, and frankly, uh, as I uh, uh, traveled uh, throughout uh, uh, industrialized Asia, um, uh, I did not see much of a, a difference in uh, time uh, uh, perception. Um, that's more uh, with a, a subculture. So Americans and Britons don't see it differently, but perhaps uh, there are uh, subgroups uh, within those cultures that, that, that view um, a, a time differently. But again, with industrialization and with the internet, kind of no one has an opportunity to really have uh, their own time view because it's all uh, imposed upon us. So that's kind of what I meant by not only is there no difference really in, um, you know, uh, in the West or in the East perceptions of time, but, but um, now, uh, you know, the, the uh, part of the globe that's the equator where people haven't had access to uh, the internet is also being uh, put into this uh, imposition of uh, under uh, having the globe synchronized to a, a particular time. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, more about your career. So you're a published writer and a TV talk show host. Is that correct? Well, I'm a TV talk show participant. Uh, people like to see me uh, occasionally uh, 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 talk about time. Uh, I had a chance to. Uh, to uh, be on both uh, uh, local uh, programs and uh, uh, once a, a national broadcast about time. So I, I, uh, I enjoy pe making people aware of time, think about time and what it means, realize you know, when, as an example, did society decide that time was money? It has to have to be something synchronized a little bit with, uh, frankly, with synchronous time, uh, because till time was synchronized, I don't know that you could specifically say that time was money. Um, so yeah, I enjoy doing uh, education. I enjoy doing research. I have uh, uh, had a little fun uh, on the, the talk show circuit. God knows why they're interested in the person that is interested in, in time, but um, I'm, I'm glad they are because then I uh, have had an opportunity actually to uh, go and talk to some young people about time. And um, I haven't found yet that ice cream shop from my childhood that had all the clocks in it where I was able to... Uh, Sort of get excited about time, but I have been able to work with a number of children's museums, uh, creating exhibits about time. Um, so I, I certainly would suggest, and it seems like a strange idea, but that I like being a proselytizer of time uh, keeping. Um, uh, my uh, I have a hobby that's sort of related to time, which is uh, cartography. And the interesting thing about both of these uh, interests, uh, my career interest of time and my hobby of cartography, uh, I often have difficulty personally being prompt and on time. That's interesting side effect. And uh, I have virtually no sense of direction. So when I am somewhere, anywhere, I need a map. And even if I have a map, if you don't know where you are, it's hard to know where you're going. So it's just sort of fascinating that these uh, these hobbies and interests of mine uh, uh, tend towards uh, what apparently are uh, aspirational aspects of uh, my personality. Pardon me, my dog is, hey, thank you. Thank you, we're on TV right now. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, any other questions or curiosities or uh, uh, ideas? Yes, definitely. Um, so what I. What time is it where you are? Sorry. What time is it where you are? It's seven fifty-eight a.m. right now. I'm on the west coast. Because do you know what time it is where I am? Where? What time is it? Ten fifty-eight. Oh, so I same. can tell you what stocks to bet on. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. That's a great advantage to have. Definitely. Um. I was actually curious about a phenomenon that we have all suffered from, I guess, and a lot of the people reading The New Yorker would be interested to know what your insights are about it, um, which is jet lag. So um, what do you think about that phenomenon? Have you ever suffered from it while commuting? I have certainly suffered from jet lag. And in fact, I uh, uh, originally years ago purchased a watch 
um, that and the airlines are now doing this. Some of the major airlines are now doing this with their uh, lighting systems, uh, which is to essentially when you fly, of course, it depends on which direction you're flying, um, your uh, wristwatch itself will gradually change you to the time that it knows you're going to. And what that does is it kind of plays with your mind. And um, as you're you know, flying, you're kind of looking at your watch and you're checking the time. And instead of it uh, being the original time, it's gradually getting you to the actual time when you arrive. Um, they're playing with uh, lighting on airplanes to try and um, to sort of synchronize with the circadian clock, given the fact that you're you know, moving uh, either east or west, uh, again, depending upon which, which way time is moving. Um, and um, uh, so it is, it is possible through sort of tricking yourself uh, through these mechanisms to, it's been proven actually, to be able to reduce uh, the symptom of jet lag. Um, uh, I did have the opportunity uh, when the Concorde was still flying uh, to once uh, have John Hopkins University sponsor me uh, in a situation where uh, when I left from New York, I was able to, uh, let me get this right. <laughs> was it London to New York or in London or, or New York to London? It was London. Anyway, I arrived earlier than I left, which quite uh, frankly plays with your mind uh, in, in this whole concept. And hopefully supersonic flight uh, will be back again in the future and we'll all be uh, able to uh, uh, arrive before we leave. Uh, and jet lag will become a thing of the past. But I think very much these uh, these techniques, I would encourage anyone who regularly travels uh, and experiences a jet lag, which is more or less impossible not to experience, uh, to uh, now the days, instead of an actual uh, physical uh, watch, you can get a, a, a smart watch that you can get an app for that will, again, uh, do this gradual movement. You tell it how long your flight is and where you're going, and it will gradually uh, you know, again, as you look at it, uh, bring you into the right time. And it's been proven that that creates a, a better and less of an effect of, uh, of jet lag on people. Uh, it is certainly interesting uh, to fly west uh, because when you're flying, you can uh, kind of keep uh, the sun with you all the time. Uh, you sort of break the idea that the sun ever sets. Um, I had a, a, a trip to uh, Asia several years ago and uh, virtually for the entire flight, uh, it was bright. Uh, because we were flying west, not east. Wow, that's yeah. I mean, so you're. We can raise the that, sun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's basically a psychological effect because if you're staying grounded to what time it is, then it will lessen the effect of it. So that's that's so interesting. Um, so you said that when you travel to certain places, you arrive earlier than you left. So. That would be some kind of, you know, time travel as people would perceive it. But do you think that actual time travel is possible? Oh, as much as I enjoy uh, the uh, cartoon Rick and Morty, uh, I don't think that uh, I'll be engaging in much time travel. Now, who knows? There are some things like um, the spooky behavior of particles that can be manipulated across the globe. One particle reacts to another particle on the other side of the globe. Not something that, um, again, the fact that the physicists had to come up with a, a name for it like spooky uh, seems like they don't really understand it. So there's certainly things out there that we don't uh, understand. Um, uh, certainly as we increase our ability to go to space, that helps, but the fact of the physical block of our being able to go faster than the speed of light is uh, certainly something that's uh, going to prevent the kind of time travel um, that has been depicted in, in, in uh, movies occurring from space voyages. You do have just a small little bit of, of time travel that occurs in the, in the uh, you know, and by that I mean traveling five minutes into the future. But um, again, this doesn't, uh, this, this is the same, the same way you can perceive of me knowing what's going to go on quicker than you because I'm three hours ahead that the, the, the amount of real time travel we can experience uh, is, is, is very minimal. It's measurable, uh, but it's minimal. Uh, and then again, it's, it's, it's more related to, to perception uh, than it is uh, the physics of time. So I don't think stepping into a time machine is something certainly 
uh, that I'll be doing anytime soon, aside from all the nightmares that you can think through in literature of what happens if you step on the butterfly that wrecks the dinosaurs and whatever. Uh, I would be uh, terribly afraid of that. And I remember as a child reading Ray Bradbury's story about the hunters who uh, went back in time to kill the dinosaur and the one hunter got off the path that he was on and apparently stepped on something. They got back on the path very quickly. They came back into the future. And the only change was because of that butterfly died, the opposite presidential candidate was, was winning. So I don't want to mess with anything like that. It's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, it, that would be yeah, that would be scary. Um, so yeah, I, I apologize that I got a little sidetracked here, but I also wanted to ask you about uh, your books and if there were any uh, particular projects that you're proud of that you think will bring insight to you know the public uh actually what i've done is i've written a whole book uh on uh the history of time rather than my academic papers i don't think the academic work i've done has an ability really to uh, impact people much i'd rather uh, uh teach people uh, uh about the history and and maybe get young people uh, uh turned on and interested in the field uh, by, by teaching them sort of accessible history. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I couldn't use the title that I wanted to use because a certain astrophysicist took it, uh, A Brief History of Time. Um, so I just left up the word brief and uh, uh, called it a history of time, not to be confused with a brief history of time. Although uh, uh, Dr. Hawking's book is quite a bit more difficult to read than mine. Uh, again, mine is extremely accessible. He tried to make his accessible, but um, that's the sort of book I have to read each page three or four times to uh, to uh, to get the time uh, concepts that are in it. Um, and uh, this book has actually uh, been on the New York Times uh, bestseller list, uh, not certainly at the top of the list, but it made it to the list, which I uh, was lauded for by my colleagues and friends. Um, and then I actually created a children's book version of it um, uh, called Happy Time. And uh, this uh, book has uh, characters in it that are actually uh, different types of clocks and timekeeping mechanisms. And uh, recently I was uh, contacted by uh, Lee Unkrich and Lee is the director who did Coco for uh, Disney. And uh, Lee is talking to me about uh, creating a, a potential a Disney movie about uh, clocks and time. So I'm pretty excited about that. Wow, that's definitely exciting. That's an incredible way to to bring those concepts to, you know, the public. And I think I'm seeing a pattern here where you're trying to bring it to, you know, the children and just everyone who's interested in time, but doesn't know how to get into it through, you know, all the jargon and the complicated scientific stuff. So, um, yeah, would you a say- very, A very good observation. I like to make uh, complex uh, topics uh, accessible to people. Mm -hmm. Have you ever found difficulty in that? in simplifying them? Um, I find that if I can uh, use visual uh, demonstrations, visual representations of data, mm -hmm. um, one of my uh, favorite authors is a man by the name of Edvard Tuft. And Edvard Tuft uh, wrote a book called The Visual Representation of Data, and uh, actually a series of books about visually representing data. And I have found uh, that it is much easier to teach people uh, concepts when I can create visual representations of them. And I have found that um, time, uh, actually many, many topics, um, uh, particularly those that obviously can be uh, measured in some way through, through numbers, um, people learn and understand the concepts much better when I use uh, visual representations. Uh, uh, we don't necessarily think of ourselves as all being um, visual learners, some people auditory learners, um, people have different learning styles, but it seems like representing data visually is the best way to uh, make more complex topics understandable to people. Definitely. I mean, you're probably raising a generation of future urologists through your work. So that's I that's certainly great. hope so. I certainly hope so. At least people with interest uh, in, in the concept and most definitely uh, interests in the uh, mechanics. Um, partially I'm able to do that. And since you're in me for the New Yorker, or I'd love it if you can get a plug in for the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors, the NAWCC. 
that is the uh, uh, organization in the United States that um, uh, has all of the uh, clock dorks and the horology nerds together. And I, I regularly give lectures there and that's quite a bit fun. Um, as well as the Royal Observatory uh, that's in London, not in Greenwich. Um, and they are uh, a, a continuous source of uh, time education um, and uh, proselytizing and trying to get time, pe people interested, young people interested in, in uh, clocks and time. And I would encourage any of you, uh, I would encourage you to go uh, uh, visit, uh, I believe it's in Philadelphia, the NAWCC Time Museum, um, or uh, look for uh, resources about time in your area and to see if you can go uh, check out some pretty cool clocks. Absolutely, yeah, I will make sure to mention all of that and make sure to check out um, all those fascinating organizations. Um, and I wanna be mindful of your time. Um, oh, I appreciate so, that, I'm, it's a, it's, as you know, it's a very important concept to me. Yes, definitely. Um, so thank you so much for all your insights and um, yeah, if you would like to share any final thoughts or um, if you, um, you know, would like to wrap this up, I just want to thank you for um, all the information that you've presented us and it will definitely fascinate our readers at the New Yorker. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, make sure you uh, keep time and uh, have a wonderful day, whatever time it is in your time zone. Thank you. I, have you, I hope you also have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Mr. Bye. Greenwich, don't run away. I shan't. All right. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Nadine. Thank you. Um, Mr. Horatio Greenwich. Yes, sir. Is in fact, um, Benjamin Zellman, who what? grew up across the street from me in the wholesome what? Midwest and is an, an orologist, perhaps by passion, but not for a living. And um, we want to thank him for helping us out. I appreciate that very, very much. Thank yeah, you, Thank sir. you so much. Thank you. Have a great day.